Yeah, yeah. Hello, I'd just like to welcome you all to tonight's Café Scientifique at the Royal Brompton. Um, these events are organised uh, through our biomedical research unit that's based on the Trust. Um, and this week, the Café Scientifique falls in Universities Week. Um, and Universities Week is a national event. Um, and this year, their aim is to have public discussions on the relevance and impact of university research on our lives. So uh, I'd like to introduce the speakers tonight who are going to be talking on chest pain and the heart. Um, and they are Reynold Silva, who's an a cardio uh, interventional cardiologist, consultant based at the Royal Brompton, and, and Alistair Lindsay, who's a cardiologist based at the Brompton. Um, so I'd just like to welcome them to. Thank you. Uh, good, e uh, right. good evening, everybody. Um, and uh, welcome to the Brompton, and thank you for the opportunity to come and tell you something about uh, chest pain. And uh, so what we're going to discuss this evening is some of the causes of chest pain, both in the acute setting and then some of the more uh, stable coronary syndromes that uh, we see a lot of uh, in this hospital. Um, and uh, what we thought of uh, was showing a, a few brief uh, animations just to put slightly more graphically uh, the kind of conditions that we're uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, and um, so I'm going to ask Alistair to start off with a brief description of the coronary circulation, the uh, basis of why patients get chest pain, and then to go through some of the acute and chronic causes of chest pain and how we are working to improve the management of these patients uh, to improve symptoms and clinical outcomes in the longer term. Alistair. Thank you, Rano. Um, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see so many of you here. Hopefully you can hear me despite the noise outside. Um, so my name is Alistair Lindsay, I'm a cardiologist here. And Rano and I specifically are both interventional cardiologists, which means specifically we treat chest pain and, and heart attacks. And we've known each other for a dozen years. And for both of us, it's our main area of treatment and also research interest. So I wonder if any of you remember this picture. It's uh, a little bit gruesome, but the British Heart Foundation used it a few years ago to try and raise public awareness of patients who were having a heart attack. And I think they put it out there for a good reason. The picture shows quite nicely the typical symptoms that we would expect in somebody who's having chest pain that does come from the heart. And specifically, you can see the belt-like constricting pain around the middle of the chest, which is very typically what we look out for when patients come to us saying that they're complaining of pain in the chest. What you might also notice is the patient looks quite grey and a little bit pale, suggesting that the circulation in general may not be working very well. And I don't think it comes across quite so well, but they're probably also a little bit sweaty. So we know that features of this are really typical of a classical heart attack picture. Interestingly, the nerves that innervate that bit of the heart also, when the signal comes from the heart that it's under distress and that there's pain, we also know that the patients often present with so-called referred pain, which describes that other nerves are also involved. The brain finds it difficult to distinguish between the nerves coming from the heart, but also patients will often describe a pain in their arm, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, and pain in their jaw. So although this pain around the chest is said to be typical, pain in the jaw or arm is also something that for us is quite often the first sign of coronary disease. Interestingly, we know that in women, it isn't always a typical picture like this. Women can quite typically present with uh, symptoms that are not like this and may not be so classical in origin, and that prevents a diagnostic dilemma to us. So this is the worst case scenario. This is somebody with a chest pain who's having a heart attack. Of course, there are other causes for chest pain, we should say too. Um, one of the diagnostic dilemmas for anybody going to an emergency department is to make sure that the pain in the chest is A, first of all, not due to heart attack, but secondly, to make sure that there's no other significant cause. So things that can cause similar pains are things, for example, like a pulmonary embolism, which can be a serious condition of its own right, but wouldn't require the treatment necessarily of a cardiologist. It may be seen by a general physician or sometimes even by respiratory doctors in the past. Musculoskeletal pains are probably one of the most common causes for people going to hospitals with chest pains. And we still see that quite a lot from our colleagues at Chelsea and Westminster who are faced with this diagnostic problem when patients come into A&E. 
Luckily, nowadays, we have very, very good ways of distinguishing heart pain from non-heart pain. And I'm sure m many of you will have had or will have heard of an ECG at some stage, which can show significant chest pain, certainly heart attack chest pain very well. But we also have a very sensitive blood biomarker now, a protein called troponin, which can really pick up over 99% of cases of genuine heart attack very, very well. So the clinical symptoms remain as important as ever, not just for us, but in terms of public awareness to make sure that when people are having chest pain, they seek treatment really expediently. But for us as cardiologists, we're lucky now that we're backed up by very good tests. So let's go on the presumption that this is a cardiac pain, because that's what we're here to discuss. Uh, the heart has three main blood vessels. And if any one of those blood vessels gets narrowed or blocked up, then people can go on to develop a heart attack. So I'd like to show this short animation of what tends to happen. So here's an average blood vessel, which you can see is obviously circular in a donut shape. It's divided into three layers, the outermost being the adventitia. Inside that is the media of the vessel. And then you can see that the media contains smooth muscles, which allows the cell to shrink, uh, sorry, allows the vessel to shrink and open according to the blood flow inside it. The intima is the innermost lining of the blood vessel. And that's important to us because we know that's where so-called plaques or atherosclerosis tend to accumulate inside the blood vessels. Generally, they start off as just a very small fatty streak. But over the years, they progress to the end stage, which is to become an atheroma or a plaque. And you can see that the amount of blood getting in through the middle there is much reduced. And in a worst case scenario, where somebody has a heart attack, a thrombus or a clot can form and block that off. If this same process happens in the neck arteries, it can cause a stroke. But in the heart, it causes a heart attack. And in the legs, it can also cause claudication, which is pain on walking. So this process whereby we know that the arteries get clogged up is something that we know quite a lot now. We know it occurs over many years. It can occur over a relatively short period of time, such as months, but then the majority of individuals occurs over many years. I'm afraid to say that most of us in this audience, um, regardless of age, probably already have something like that to some extent in our arteries because we know from post-mortem studies of soldiers in battle going back to the 70s that this plaque building process starts at a very young age. And a lot of our research and a lot of public health work is looking at how we can prevent coronary disease occurring in the first place as much as we need to treat it. So, how does that plaque get there? Well, that's something that Rana was going to tell us a little bit more about. Yeah, well, part of our research is really focusing on why do plaques develop in certain parts of the coronary circulation. It's clear that uh, there are certain parts of the heart arteries that are particularly prone uh, to developing coronary artery narrowings. And these are often up at the proximal ends, so the top ends uh, of each of the three major coronary arteries, and also at branch points uh, where you have side branches coming off the main artery. We know at these particular locations that there are disturbances, disturbances of the blood flow. And part of our research is about modeling those patterns of blood flow within the coronary arteries using a number of different imaging techniques and measurements of blood flow using special wires that measure the velocity of blood as it flows through the heart. But then from that information, modeling the, the three-dimensional distribution of how that blood flow uh, occurs. We know that when blood flows across the um, intima, that non-stick lining that uh, on the inner portion of the blood vessel that Alistair showed you before, that that exerts a force uh, on, that, uh, uh, on the cells of that, uh, that make up that inner lining. And if you have a disturbance of blood flow and an alteration of the force exerted on those vessels, that changes uh, the behavior of those uh, cells in specific locations, making it more prone to the development of atherosclerosis and the deposition of, of cholesterol uh, within the walls of the blood vessels and then the development of a narrowing within the coronary artery. And these types of techniques are very difficult to do at high resolution, and this is something that we're focusing on particularly. We can see in this particular animation that we've modeled a narrowing within the coronary artery and uh, that in the bright colors on the upper surface of the vessel is where the uh, force on the inner lining of the blood vessel is high as blood accelerates over 
but in the lower parts, in the lower borders of the vessel, the blood flow is slightly slower, and that uh, 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 predisposes to the development of uh, changes in the shape of the blood vessel wall and the development of the types of narrowing that not only go on to develop angina, but also prone uh, to development of heart attack, which uh, Alastair is going to tell you about in the next animation. Sure. So just before we do that, so this very nice example of the beginning and the end of the vessel, we can see the narrowing in the middle where the vessel is pinched, and that will give you an angina pain, as Rano says, which is a, a, a pain on walking, but importantly, that pain goes away when you stop exerting yourself. In this next slide, what I wanted to show you was that uh, what we see in the heart attack picture at the beginning is a little bit different. So here's one of the main coronary arteries, and the yellow stuff is the plaque, the atheroma that I mentioned in the previous slide. And you can see here it's bulging into the artery and blood is flowing down as normal. So you may not know it's there. But here's where the trouble starts, so-called plaque rupture. So um, quite dramatic demonstration, but unfortunately it is sometimes like that. You can see the ECG tracing in the top left, is meaning that the patient has gone into ventricular fibrillation, so the heart rhythm is broken down. And the reason for that is due to this plaque rupture. The important thing to note is that it's not the cholesterol per se itself that causes this blockage, it's the body's reaction to the cholesterol. There's a cap on the plaque, which we see here as a lining, and if that's breached for any reason, the body instantly recognizes that this material that's accumulated in the artery shouldn't really be there. So it attacks it, and the way it attacks it is it tries to form a blood clot on it. Unfortunately, in the case of your coronary arteries, that blood clot gets stuck, stops the blood flow, and that's what causes all the problems. If the heart muscle isn't supplied by any blood, then it's using up oxygen, but it's not getting any oxygen, and therefore it starts giving us angina pain. It also, the same lack of oxygen leads to the breakdown in the ECG that we see there. So when we see that picture at the beginning of the patient having a heart attack, this is the worst case scenario of what would be happening. We do see more minor or milder types of heart attack, whereby some clot forms on the surface, but as in this case where you can see the artery is completely blocked by the thrombus, in many cases, fortunately, the artery isn't totally blocked by the clot, the thrombus, and therefore the patient's still getting some blood to the heart, and that gives us some time to get them to the hospital. And when we do angiogram procedures, we quite simply pass a wire through this blockage, through the clot, we put in a balloon, and we put in a, a stent to open up the artery. Just to show you what that process looks like, so this is a patient who's had an angiogram test. This is the LED, the main artery, and you can probably see this is the beginning of the vessel, this is further down the vessel, and the problem lies in here. It's very irregular and it's very pinched. So the cholesterol, the plaque, has all accumulated in the wall there, and as we saw in that previous illustration, what's happened here is the plaque has ruptured open. On the right-hand side, on the left-hand side is an x-ray picture. On the right-hand side, what you see is uh, optical coherence tomography, or we'll refer to it as OCT, which in essence is really a laser-like picture of the inside of the vessel. And this shows us rather nicely that what we see is a rupture of the cap of this is the atheroma, in this case, where the star is, and that's what's caused the thrombus to form and cause the heart attack here. This is just a longitudinal view of the same thing, and the arrows are pointing to the fact that there was some atheroma here in the coronary artery, and it seems to have ruptured open. So, what do we do with that? Well, we get the patient to our cardiac cath labs, of which we have five here, as soon as possible. If you have certain changes on your ECG and you're presenting with a very bad heart attack, London Ambulance will actually take you directly to a heart attack center. But for those cases where there's more time because the patient's pain is settling or the ECG isn't so bad, they will come to a hospital like ours. We will do an angiogram picture like we do in the left, and we'll then think about putting in a coronary stent. And a coronary stent looks a little bit like this blue mesh here. Right, so this is, uh, again, um, developed... This is a 3D reconstruction of those images that you saw on the right-hand panel on the previous uh, slide. So this is now flying through the artery, um, uh, uh, getting a virtual 3D visualization of what it's like within the artery. In the first part of the animation, what you see is these blue crisscross meshes uh, that you'll see, and these are where the stent has been deployed. 
and these other uh, um, uh, sort of uh, color coded areas within the artery, for example, the yellow section is where you've got de deposits of cholesterol. The white section are calcium, that's bone like hardening within the wall of the vessel. And these green areas are what are, uh, represent macrophages, and these are inflammatory cells that are very important in terms of uh, promoting uh, both the development of um, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque and also creating that process of rupture. Uh, and part of our research is to identify why is it that some artery narrowings are prone to development mm -hmm. of rupture and heart attack and can we do better in terms of identifying those up front in order to provide some sort of preemptive therapy to prevent these types of catastrophic events happening. Just to give you an idea of the kind of resolution that we're looking at, this is about uh, 20 uh, microns. So think about a red blood cell. It's about three times the size of a red blood cell in terms of the resolution that we're looking at now with these laser imaging uh, within the coronary artery. The newer techniques that are coming upstream are going to give us even better resolution, such that we'll be able to see individual inflammatory cells crossing the blood vessel wall, and this will give us a much more detailed understanding in terms of which particular heart artery narrowings are particularly prone to developing heart attack uh, down the track. Stents. Yes. The first picture that we showed you was in relation to the kind of stents that we routinely use in clinical practice. And those are essentially metallic stents. Initially, the ones that we used were made out of stainless steel. But with the newer generation of stents, we've used different alloys, platinum, cobalt, and chromium uh, in order to give better radial strength to prevent the artery from collapsing down on itself. And in addition, we've coated these stents now with special drugs which prevent inflammation and proliferation of cells from the vessel wall, which, which uh, are responsible for narrowing, re-narrowing of the artery within the previously deployed stents. However, stents also, if we have used metallic stents, they're permanent implants, they too can be associated with a number of downstream problems in the longer term. So the latest idea now is to use stents that do the job acutely in terms of keeping the artery open, but stents that don't stay there forever. And these are what we call bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds. So these are stents that over a period of about two years disappear. They're absorbed by the body into carbon dioxide and water. They don't stay as permanent implants within the coronary circulation. So what you might see here in the bottom right is um, uh, these uh, structures, which are the stent at the time of deployment within the coronary artery. But as we look out from six months to two years, these stent struts, which are these, um, uh, 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 these dark areas surrounded by a bright white signal, those are the struts, struts that make up the stent, they disappear and are resorbed uh, completely over a two-year period. And this is important for two reasons. First of all, because you're not leaving a permanent metallic implant within the artery, but also the placement of that stent seems to alter the biology of what is happening within the vessel wall, causing it to expand and uh, prevent uh, further narrowing downstream. We're one of the few hospitals uh, in the country that have access to this technology, and now we're re routinely using these um, uh, for, for our patients. But again, at very early stages and, uh, uh, and currently under evaluated, evaluation, but a very exciting uh, technology for us. Next one, Alistair. Sure. Okay. Uh, now. This is, ah, yes. yes. All right. So, maybe, we'll just, yeah, so sure. maybe we'll just stop there for a second. Yeah. What, we've de what we've dealt with um, at this particular stage is the patients who are, uh, who are uh, presenting as emergencies to the cardiac catheter lab with acute chest pain and suspected heart attack. And we focused really in uh, on the acute management of these patients. Um, but clearly, there are a number of, a, a massive group of patients who have stable coronary syndromes. We have an aging population. Stable coronary disease is getting more and more prevalent. In the UK, currently, there are about two million men and women who've experienced angina at some stage of their life, and this number is getting bigger and bigger. We are also facing a number of patients who 
have had multiple angioplasties and stents, as you've seen. They might have had one or two bypass operations, but yet they still may experience a significant amount of chest pain despite conventional treatments with these revascularization procedures and also despite medical therapy. And what we're interested in doing is for this group of patients who we define as having refractory angina, a large number of those patients get referred into this hospital, what can we do to help them? And an example of the array of different modalities that we have is a new device uh, that we are evaluating. And this is a stent that doesn't go into one of the arteries of the heart, but a stent that goes into the main vein draining your heart. Okay? So uh, these are patients uh, with advanced coronary artery disease. They've had multiple bypass uh, procedures uh, before. Uh, and uh, in, the, in patients who have stable uh, angina, uh, angina, there are certain parts of the heart muscle that are particularly prone to a shortage of blood supply. And these are essentially the inner layers of the heart muscle. And these are really the workhorse regions of the heart that are doing all the work in terms of pumping blood around the heart. Uh, around the rest of the body. But remember that the heart arteries are running on the outside surface of the, uh, of the heart, and these have now got to supply blood to the workhorse areas on the inner layers. If you have a narrowing in one of your heart arteries, it's those inner layers of the heart muscle that are particularly prone to developing a shortage of blood supply. And it is those areas of the heart that this uh, treatment is designed uh, to aid. What we do is we place a stent within the main vein of the heart that causes a buildup of pressure in the venous system of the heart and keeps those very tiny blood vessels in the inner part layers of the heart muscle open, preventing shortage of blood supply and what we call ischemia, which is this imbalance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand. And this has been very effective in terms of um, relieving angina. So we've just completed and been part of an international clinical trial evaluating this device in about 120 patients and shown for these no option patients, no further options for angioplasty, they're on maximum tablet treatment, they've already had one or two bypass surgeries, that in about half the patients we can significantly improve their symptoms of angina, that we can significantly improve their quality of life, and this is part of the various uh, armamentarium of new modalities of treatment that we're developing for our patients with stable coronary disease. Now, of course, in this hospital, we're also interested in opening arteries that have been blocked for many years, uh, and we have a number of techniques for doing that, and we have very skilled operators uh, who are, are expert in that area. But those are conventional treatments we have to look uh, to innovate and develop new treatments for our patients who are becoming ever more complex uh, um, uh, in, the, in the current era. I think that's all we mm. want to say yeah. uh, so far. Um, and we'll open the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Alistair and, and Ranul. Um, if you've got any questions, just put your hand up and I'll come over with the microphone. Um, if there's any questions that are related to any health advice you want, I would suggest you might be speak to Ranul and Alistair after the event, or we've got some um, information on the British Heart Foundation Heart Helpline. Good evening. Thank you very much for your talk. It was just fascinating. Um, uh, just a brief question. Um, you talked about inflammation, and I've heard it suggested that the plaque and things associated with it are in fact a form of infection, um, and that there are evidence of antibodies associated with that, and it might in fact be a response to an earlier inf infection in the body, not just eating too much, but, 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 but perhaps, perhaps something more, more medical, more, more, yeah. more clinical. Um, I was just wondering if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, uh, the classic theory in terms of atherosclerosis and the initiation of furring up of arteries was what they call the response to injury hypothesis. So there's that, that, the intima, that inner non-stick lining of the blood vessels is prone to a number of different forms of injury, of which infection is one. 
High cholesterol is another, cigarette smoking is another, diabetes is another. All of these creating this pro-inflammatory background uh, uh, against which uh, our cholesterol deposits can happen, uh, can, uh, can occur in areas of particular flow conditions, which is why narrowings happen in particular locations. You're absolutely right. People have found not only antibodies against various bugs, they found genetic material from various bugs within uh, the, the hearts, uh, within uh, these heart artery narrowings when you take bits of these plaque out and, uh, and study them. And there's uh, clearly a, a, a proportion of patients where those types of inflammatory stimuli are a contributory factor. The bottom line, though, is that a number of people have tried over the years trials of various antibiotics in order to treat uh, atherosclerosis and to try and prevent the risk, of, the risk of future heart attack. All of them have been failures. And the question is, uh, these, while these types of um, uh, stim inflammatory stimuli may be important in terms of the development of the atherosclerotic process, in terms of their role in triggering an acute heart attack and in terms of what we can do in terms of treating it, I don't think we've got many more uh, options and they're probably not that important. All the trials have been very negative thus far. Uh, the, the new stents you mentioned, uh, yes. they, I, I, when I had my stents put in, unfortunately they weren't available, but uh, <laughs> I did know about them. But, um, the experience you've had so far with them, though, you, you say that um, they, they are absorbed within a couple of years. Now, I believe that most heart problems, you probably disagree, I don't know, are genetically caused. Um, and that if that is the case, what happens with those uh, absorbable uh, stents? Do, uh, does it come back again, irrespective of how good someone's diet is or right. what other um, so, uh, problems they have? Treatment of coronary artery disease with either a stent or a bypass procedure is not a cure for the underlying mm. process that caused that narrowing to be there in the first place. Yeah. Okay? So I think that's an important take-home message. In terms of uh, th these... Uh, your question was in relation to the stent or the heart artery narrowing after it's stented and the stent's gone away? It's, well, it's the consequences afterwards, really. But, uh, right. um, so so what, we are, what we know so far, and I would caution that this is a very early experience. I mean, worldwide, mm -hmm. the experience with these new devices is very limited. What we seem to know and what we've learned from imaging of the heart arteries is that the placement of these stents seems to for some reason attenuate the development of that furring process, at least up for the, t for the period of time that we've been able to study it. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is what the, what's going to happen in the longer term. So remember, but stents are part of the entire treatment package for mm -hmm. coronary artery disease, which is lifestyle, your diet, exercise, not smoking, the medication, your aspirin, ACE inhibitors, statin drugs for lowering your cholesterol. Those are the things that are going to impact on the disease process that caused that narrowing to be there in the first place. So the stent is operating the same way as a metal stent, basically. Yeah, it's doing yes. the job, but it's just mm -hmm. not hanging around there yeah. forever and ever. Yeah. You, you mentioned about the atheroma and the cholesterol. Yes. I read something a couple of weeks ago where they're suggesting it's not due to uh, saturated fat. Mm -hmm. It's due to carbohydrate excess. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to comment on that? Well, yeah, I, I know what you mean. There's been a lot of debate about this. So for years we said avoid saturated fat, but there's been some recent research that has questioned how tight the association between saturated fat and coronary disease is. I have to say I think it's a little bit early to sort of... Uh, change our course from years of saying avoid saturated fats. I think there's still some more work to be done. Uh, but that has been something that's, that's come up recently. But uh, I would reiterate what, what Rano says. It's part of a, a package, really. It really is. Uh, we know that cholesterol, in terms of coronary disease, it's arguable that it's the most important risk factor for heart disease. Blood pressure is equally as important. Smoking is. Uh, there's some fascinating research on psychological factors as well. Um, all of these things are important. 
family and genetics absolutely has a role. You're quite right. It's just a little bit more difficult. We know that if you have a heart attack under the age of roughly the age of 60, then there does seem to be some genetic element in, in many cases. But uh, other than that, we are not yet at the stage where we can use the genetics to help inform us about our treatments and preventing heart attack to any great degree. Wow. That's interesting. Because I've never smoked and I've never eaten too much fat. Yes. Yet I got... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there are people who can turn yes. lettuce leaves into cholesterol. But, <laughs> just, I, I always fall between the, yeah. uh, the options. Right? But just yeah. to link that up with the last point, uh, the gentleman was asking about inflammation. Yeah. I can tell you that patients with psoriasis are more prone to get coronary artery disease. Oh. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis are more prone to get coronary artery disease. So that link with inflammation is there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, even though you may have a perfect diet and be a perfect weight, we're beginning to realize that in terms of starting off the process and sometimes also triggering a heart attack, that may be the, the key. Thank you. Are you therefore saying that this might have links with an autoimmune disease? Well, there again, so there are some autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis being an autoimmune disease, but there are others also. Seeing you mentioned linked. that. Yes, but I, I don't think it's a link with any specific disease. It's coming back to this inflammatory process as a trigger of injuring the wall of the artery and thereafter cholesterol and various other cells get in and that's what seems to clog up the arteries. But the concept of autoimmunity is absolutely correct. Yeah. We referred previously to these various components of uh, bacteria that can be found within the ve vessels of the wall, mm. uh, of, uh, in heart artery plaques. And the suggestion is that there are some components of those bacteria, for example, that resemble uh, in terms of their molecular structure the, uh, inner, uh, the constituents of the inner lining of the blood vessels and the mounting of the immune response in order to deal with those bugs can then cause a set of a formation of a set of antibodies and other immune cells get the, that can then react against the body's own blood vessels. So yes, there is definitely a school of thought uh, that, may, that that may be a possible um, uh, uh, etiological factor. And also in the context of um, your heart muscle or the amount of heart muscle damage that happens after a heart attack uh, as well. That may be an important factor. So is the cholesterol, I mean, we all have to make it. I mean, it, it, it forms the uh, basic building brick of, of, of the cell yeah, wall. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. So, so is this um, in some folk then a reaction to their basic cholesterol state state status against whatever uh, bug problem they may uh, be encountering well remember it's not just it's not just yeah. so cholesterol needs to be metabolized within the wall of the blood vessel in order to form the 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 types of cholesterol that actually promote inflammation within the heart vessel wall that uh, exact that uh, propagates the development of an atherosclerotic plaque and so you may have the cholesterol, but then you also need to be able to uh, have uh, to make the bad forms of cholesterol in order to get have the plaque uh, uh, develop. Now, clearly, that will vary from individual to individual, and so the same level of cholesterol may impact itself in terms of coronary artery narrowings in a very different way from individual to individual. You mean the, the ratio of LDL to HDL? No, and also in terms of what we call the oxidized LDL mm. within, the, heart, within the blood vessel wall itself. Uh, uh, and that is a very important constituent of the blood vessel wall that promotes the influx of these inflammatory cells and the development of inf an inflammatory reaction within the heart vessel wall that promotes the formation of these plaques. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. The bio stands, how the immune system reacts to the bio stand? Do you think it tries to reject them? No, Sorry, well, it's I, made, it's, it's made, it's made it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's made up of a, 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 there are several different categories. The ones that we're using in cl routine clinical pra practice are made out of a, um, a polymer called polylactic, lact, polylactic, PLLA, PLLA, PLLA. These are just uh, chronically absorbed by the body into carbon dioxide and water over mm. time. Uh, and so they are biologically relatively uh, inert. And from the current data we have, 
don't seem to exert an immune or do not seem to initiate an immune response uh, by the body because these are, are, are compounds that are probably commonly found. Which is different from our metallic stents which are coated with polymers to which elute these drugs out which can, ex which can elicit almost like an allergic reaction uh, when they contact with the vessel wall which is one of the modes of the failure of these stents in the longer term which is why which has really been the rationale for developing these bioabsorbable scaffolds mm. peter uh, hello uh, can i can i ask uh, what's happened to all the promise of stem cells and well, you know they were, they were very prominent in the media mm. and it all seems to have gone quiet what's what's what are what do you think are the prospects for repairing heart muscle using stem cells um, well, I have you know, a, the, a, a view on that, and I yes. think we're still quite a long way away. They seem uh, like a very intelligent solution, right. though, to so, try and regrow heart muscle. It seems yes. like a much greater promise in right. the long run. So, 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 the, so the main issues are this. It seems like a very attractive concept to take a cell that has the potential to grow into lots of different cell types and to put it into the heart and then, hey, presto, we're going to grow new blood vessels, we're going to grow new heart muscle, that's a very nice, conceptually a nice framework. Well, there was some zebrafish from the BHF that's had that property. Remember that was... There was well, some, zebrafish, some... Is, zebrafish hearts do regenerate. There's, yes, no that, there's, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. But to be able to do that in a high-order mammalian heart is a real challenge. Because if we think, I mean, if you think about the way that the coronary... So let's think about angina and in terms of trying to grow new blood vessels. We have to be able to not only grow, form those new blood vessels, but then they need to be able to integrate in a coordinated way with the pre-existing vascular network in order to create a circulation that not only improves your blood supply at rest, but also re responds to the various physiological demands on the body. Now, there are various components of the arterial tree that are responsible for doing various bits in terms of your physiological response of blood flow to exercise. To think that one cell just blindly injected into one location in order to be able to recreate what nature has been, uh, you know, created over millions and millions of years, I think we'd be jolly lucky if we achieved yeah. it. Um, I, I, we're, a long, we're a long way I, from it. I would just, yeah, I completely agree. I, I would add to that. The, the, the science at the moment is there's still no uh, agreement or consensus about which type of stem cell is best. So do you take bone marrow stem cells from the patient themselves, or do you try and regenerate embryonic stem cells? And both have been investigated, and some people are more in one camp than the other. Rano pointed out very nicely, the next dilemma is how do you get those cells into the heart? So we've done some studies here, not quite in stem cells, but a similar sort of thing where we injected them down the coronary arteries, and you just hope they find the right place. But other people have injected them directly into the heart, and there are various other ways you can think about doing it too. And then the third thing is, how do you measure if they're making a difference or not? And that's, in some ways, we have very good tests and scans to do that. But in other ways, if we're looking at very small improvements that these cells can give us as we get used to working out how they actually help us, then that can be quite hard how to do. And we've used, uh, well, we haven't used it, but other centers have used MRI for that purpose, and I, I think it will be useful there. But it's, it's, it's a tough area to study for many so, reasons. So, so I'm, I'm not, I'll, sorry, I'll not much a barges, but the zebrafish is a much simpler heart, is it? It's a much simpler type of muscle. Yeah, so essence, that's why yeah. that works. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, a long so, way from so, our so, muscle. So, so let me give you a very direct example. We've been running a clinical trial um, uh, of um, a certain type of stem cell that is supposed to be of the type that is particularly potent in terms of growing new blood vessels. We've taken those out of the bone marrow and then injected them into patients who have critical limb uh, arterial disease. So people who have very bad claudication pain, uh, who, are at who are at risk of losing their limbs because of uh, uh, loss of blood supply. We've injected those cells in a randomized trial and really found no improvement in terms of um, improving their walking test parameters and actually even getting the cells out in sufficient number to dose the patients adequately is a real challenge. Periodically it hits the headlines with somebody somewhere finding a new way of making stem cells and it, you know, it, mm. it just periodically it hits yeah, the top of the news. Yeah, but it's, I, I, it sounds I, like it's a long way off. It is, it is a very long way off yeah. and unfortunately as I alluded to earlier in the stem cell field, all the headlines are being hit for the wrong reasons recently. Yeah. Yeah.
Following on from that question, mm. um, I, th I think I read something in the Heart magazine about 3D printing of hearts. Would that have any uh, possibility as a replacement heart? Is that possible? Well, th 3D printing is often very useful in terms of modeling uh, the heart, for example, uh, for making bespoke vascular stents, for example, for aneurysms within mm -hmm. uh, the heart, uh, within uh, the aorta, or uh, for um, uh, exostents, for example, yes. for patients yeah. uh, who have Marfan's and aortic disease. Um, I'm not aware that that's going to, at this stage, majorly change the way that we manage patients with coronary disease, unless yes. you're aware. No, no, it's, it's, it's a good question because we actually, um, we've been using, uh, I also put in the heart valves um, via keyhole technique and we actually have been using 3D printouts of our patient's CT scans and um, we're finding it quite useful actually just to see the anatomy, make sure we measure the size of the valve correctly and we can see the heart in 3D. But that's obviously just a, a polymer, it's a fixed piece of plastic. Actually translating that into a functioning working heart will be a, a huge challenge and I honestly don't think I've, I've seen anyone do it. There, there was a famous case from Harvard last year or the year before where they managed to make a heart scaffold. I don't know if anyone saw that by dissolving all the tissues and the scaffold they could then regrow cells and make a, a fresh heart on but um, the 3D printing I, I haven't seen that anywhere. No. That'd be next year perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 3D printing may be very important in terms of, for example, modeling the heart yes. and then yeah. virtu and basically doing your procedure virtually before you actually get into the patient. Yeah. So rehearsing an operative procedure in advance of actually getting to the patient to try and, under to, uh, try and have an understanding of the problems that you may encounter. That sort of approach, I think, is going to bear a lot of fruit. Any more questions? Another question over here, or maybe he's changed his mind. That's all. Right. We can. Earlier, you were saying that um, these patients who are not acute, yes, you can deal with. I take it that's because you do not have an A and E department, but they, all the A and E folk have to go to the Chelsea or one of the other hospitals around. Yes, correct. So we have a very close link with Chelsea because they feed us the vast majority, if not almost all of our patients that don't come from, we have some that come from outside London, but Chelsea send us all our acute work and also our stable work. Um, we're not part of the London Heart Attack Programme where an ambulance would drive you directly to the hospital. There are 10 hospitals in London that are part of that, at least maybe more. But uh, other than that, we, t we treat everything else. Chelsea and Westminster, if you were to walk through the front door with a heart attack, they certainly would send you straight up to us. That's, they're good that way. So as a tertiary center, you have this strong link with them. Yes. Do you have other links of a similar nature with hospitals further out in, in, in the periphery of the, within well, the M25? It, it, interestingly, there's been quite a big geographic shift. So 20 years ago, the Brompton was one of the few places you could get a stent put in. Um, and in line with government policy, but also really but what patients wanted to, it, we've now seen that cath labs like the five we have here are now becoming more prominent in many district general hospitals. So in fact, many people now, in fact, well, Dr. De Silva is a good example, he works at Ealing as well, and uh, many patients will now have a stent put in the local hospital. Um, interestingly, for other more complicated things we do, and I, I mentioned heart valves, we still get referrals from as far away as Scotland that, that come down to, to see us. But for treating artery disease, because it is so prevalent in the community, we're now taking the treatment more towards the community. The answer to your question is yes. We do have very strong links with other hospitals other than Chelsea. So mm. Alistair mentioned Ealing. But if we have a particularly complex patient where perhaps they're best treated in this hospital, we'll bring them over and I'll treat them here rather than necessarily doing it Ealing. And we have similar relationships with several other district general hospitals across northwest and southwest London. So, so yeah, the links are strong with mm. uh, all of our partners elsewhere. And, the, and there was one thing about your uh, presentation that I wasn't, didn't quite catch, didn't quite understand, where you're using, is it a, a, a restrictor in the veins? Yes. Um, it's like an hourglass yes. stent, yeah. which gradually constricts over time. It raises the pressure, 
within the vein and that back pressure then keeps the capillaries open because you've got this continuum of blood from the arteries into the arterioles into the capillary system and then into the veins so if we increase the pressure in the veins then we can keep the capillaries open and that then forces blood preferentially into the areas that are short of it in these patients with chronic angina. You're causing local increases of pressure. Correct. In the venous system. Um, just that uh, method you just described, it sounds kind of forceful. Would that not cause um, further damage to the heart tissue? Well, remember the stent is an hourglass uh, and it doesn't cause any restriction of flow out of the vein in the, in the, uh, at the time of implantation. This stent gradually reduces in terms of the diameter of that main draining vein of the heart out uh, over a period of about six months. So it's a very gradual process and the heart then adapts over that time. So it's not an acute insult uh, to the coronary vein. So actually it's tolerated incredibly well and the patients who we've implanted the device in have felt significantly better. But I would, yeah, I could just add that when we do put in stents and things in an artery, generally we have to stretch the artery to open it up and, and move the debris to one side. And uh, you can certainly rupture a coronary artery. I think we can both tell you that, unfortunately. But um, you would be also very surprised at uh, how flexible the arteries are. And in general, we try and put in as big a stent as we can in the arteries because we know that they tend to stay open for longer and are less prone to cause any problems in the future. So you have to be a bit cautious, but in general you can stretch an artery to a certain extent quite successfully. Uh, and the other thing is that we're, you know, it's not a one size fits all. These stents are then sized according to the measurements, we make very detailed measurements of the size of the heart arteries, so they're, 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 the, the, the deployment is tailored according to the individual anatomy of the patient. Sorry, are stents uh, put into veins where a patient has had a, a coronary bypass, uh, where the arteries have become blocked? Yes. And yes. stents are put in veins. Correct. Are they successful? And can you put in these new stents in the vein also? Uh, uh, so what we described is the stainless steel stent that goes into the main draining vein of the heart. We are not at the stage where we would put uh, design these uh, absorbable stents. And in fact, that would probably defeat the object of the exercise because we act for, the, for, the, for the treatment of the coronary vein with a stent, we want a permanent implant. We don't want something that's going to disappear uh, over time. Um, and in fact, what we're doing is just reinventing what the surgeons did about 60 years ago. So before the advent of coronary artery bypass surgery, the, the chief surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States, a chap called Claude Beck, what he used to do was he used to take the main draining vein of the heart, which on this model uh, comes uh, around here, around the back of the heart. He used to put a stitch around it and tie off the coronary sinus in order to increase the pressure uh, within the veins, as we've discussed, to improve the blood supply in the microcirculation, by the microcirculation. Uh, and he found that a, a very effective treatment for patients with angina and that's what they used to do before we had coronary artery bypass grafting. Mm. But yes, that's a very good question. Quite often we find ourselves putting stents designed for arteries inside veins that surgeons have put in as part of a, a bypass procedure. Uh, veins don't stay as open as well as arteries in terms of the surgical outcomes and therefore we quite often have patients coming back with some narrowings in the veins the surgeons have made for them and we can put a stent in there. Arteries and leg, leg, yes. Veins, no. no, I don't think so. I've no. not heard of that one. Yeah. And, and we, we try and avoid putting stents in veins, in, especially in small veins in the leg, because uh, it's a slow flow system, uh, as opposed to an artery where the flow is very brisk. 
And so if you put a stent in a vein in a low flow system, you're very likely to, to, to develop a blood clot and for the stent to occlude over time. Any more questions? Um, I'd just quite to ask one question. In terms of the, the plaque rupture, mm. um, you said that there's obviously research to think about why that's, why that's triggered. Yes. Are there any sort of theories about why some people's plaque ruptures and why some yeah. doesn't? Well, there are a number of provoking factors. Um, exercise is one of them. Uh, the second thing is it's also got to do with the pre-existing um, sort of insults, if you like, to the coronary circulation that have happened over time. High cholesterol, diet, cigarette smoking, all of those things that are, are, are particularly prone to the exaggeration of, the, of that atherosclerotic pr process that Alistair showed you. Now, if as part of that process, uh, you have uh, that occurring in areas of the heart artery with those disturbed flow conditions. We know that there are certain patterns of disturbed flow condition that, that uh, make you particularly prone to developing a rupture. Now then, in terms of what triggers that rupture, it could be an emotional stress, it could be exercise, it could be a drug, it could be an infection, there are a multiplicity of different mechanisms in terms of what the trigger for that process is. But in terms of providing the substrate, i.e. a plaque that is vulnerable to the development of a rupture event, there are clearly a number of mechanisms uh, that are responsible for that. And by understanding those mechanisms, we hope that we'll be able to identify those and then develop upfront treatments. For example, people are already talking about using these vascular scaffolds they disappear after a couple of years. They seem to, uh, uh, to change the biology of what's happening in the, uh, in, in, of the vessel wall. So perhaps if we are very good at ad identifying those arteries that are prone, uh, are prone to rupture risk in the future and causing a heart attack, perhaps we can prevent it by putting in these stents. Now that's pure speculation, yeah. pure speculation. I think yeah. we're a long way away from that. But certainly that is the way that people are thinking about how to do this. Now obviously these types of plaques that we think are prone to rupture can occur at multiple points not all of, uh, within the coronary circulation not all of them do. It's a fairly blunt tool to try and stent the whole lot and I think that's probably not going to be the solution. Yeah. What we want to do is to try and prevent the process from happening in the first place. And I think we have to remember that coronary artery disease is a good news story. Okay. Over the last 50 years, mortality from coronary disease has dropped immensely, between 30 and 50 percent, depending on which part of the world that you're in. Public health measures such as stop stopping smoking in public places, education, the knowledge of the, the, of the important dietary factors that are responsible and lifestyle factors that are responsible for the development of atherosclerosis, all of those public health measures, together with an increased awareness when you're getting symptoms of chest pain, come to hospital early. We don't see the kind of patients who were absolutely horribly sick when I was training now. We just don't see them anymore, you know, yeah. because people are coming to hospital much earlier and they're getting their arteries opened a lot earlier. And that means they're less sick acutely and they have less damage to their heart muscle, which means that they don't run into problems with heart failure and all the downstream sequelae of that in the future. So coronary artery disease, we're doing well. But if we think about it worldwide, there are still 17 million people a year worldwide who are dying every year of coronary disease. It is still the number one killer on the planet. So whilst we're doing well, we mustn't get complacent about it. I would just add that the list of things that is known to trigger a heart attack is very long and one of them is the Football World Cup, so please don't get too excited. <laughs> Being Scottish, I don't have that problem this yeah. summer, obviously. Yeah. Well, that's right. When, Wembley Stadium, every match, there's a patient yeah. uh, who gets admitted for, with a heart attack, yeah. pretty much, um, I was during a game. Yeah. Sorry, I was very interested to hear about this uh, biomarker that you mentioned, this troponin. Yes. Um, 
Can you tell me, is it a biomarker which indicates that somebody has had a big problem, mm -hmm. or is it a biomarker that is in more general use now to say you might have a problem in this area and you perhaps ought to keep an eye on it right. kind of thing? Yes, well, uh, Randall's the real expert. Right. Well, I'll let him answer that one. Okay. He does uh, a lot of research yeah, on okay. it. So, uh, troponin is not a biomarker that we would use to track the progression of a disease. It is a diagnostic tool that will tell you, have you had any significant damage to the heart muscle? It does not tell you what the cause of that heart muscle damage is. So that's why when we take a troponin test, we need to interpret it in the context of the clinical scenario. Does the patient have all those classical symptoms that Alistair described at the beginning, that constriction around the chest going up to the throat and jaw down your arm? Does the patient have risk factors for coronary artery disease? And importantly, are there changes on the heart tracing, the ECG? All of those three factors are needed for the diagnosis of a myocardial infarction. Alistair also mentioned to you that we have these increasingly sensitive tests now for diagnosis of troponin. That is wonderful in some respects, but it's an absolute pain in the backside for, many, for a number of other respects. Because if you take the general chest pain population who are admitted to a &E, and in the UK there are something like 800,000 attendances each year for chest pain in accident and emergency departments throughout uh, the country, then a large number of those people are going to have troponin tests done. And a large number of those people are going to be, have detectable levels of troponin. The question is, is that troponin arising from heart muscle damage from a problem within the coronary arteries. It is clear that there are many other causes for elevation of troponin, right? So if you had a knife, unfortunately, stuck in your chest, that will cause heart muscle damage, and you will have a positive troponin. Clearly, you haven't had a heart attack, right? If somebody um, uh, happens to uh, have punched you in the chest, that also can cause heart muscle damage. We've also been engaged in research looking at our stable coronary disease population where you know, people who are ambulant and well and clearly not in the throes of a heart attack have elevated levels of troponin. If you put them on a treadmill test and you exercise them, their troponins go up even further. So at the moment what we're faced with is with a situation where we are admitting a lot of people with suspected heart attack on the basis of this one measurement and the one measurement uh, is, is driving a clinical pathway that may have nothing to do with the patient's initial clinical presentation. So troponins, they're wonderful tests but only if used with appropriate clinical judgment. Is there any correlation between what you've been describing and uh, arrhythmia within the heart? Would could these? Yes, absolutely. So, as Alistair showed you in that first animation, you had the explosion of the coronary plaque uh, and um, the blockage of the heart artery, and then you have this normal pattern of electrical activity in the top, in the green lines on top. As the blood clot forms and you develop a shortage of blood supply to the heart muscle, that can promote electrical instability and then this development of chaotic, disorganized electrical activity, which is what we call ventricular fibrillation, which is the mechanism of sudden cardiac death. And remember, half of patients with heart attack die suddenly at home before they ever make it to an accident and emergency department or before they call for help. That's why the early identification of plaques which are at risk of developing a rupture and development of these downstream sequelae is so important. Interestingly, if you have a patient with a blocked coronary artery and then you take them to the cath lab and then you open the artery and re-establish the blood supply, that process itself can also promote the, form, the development of this chaotic electrical activity and ventricular fibrillation. But of course, that's a far less dangerous scenario because they're in the middle of a cath lab with all the equipment and personnel ready to deal with that prob problem. 
uh, and uh, that is uh, dealt with with a cut, what we call defibrillation, which is a shock to the front of the uh, chest. With defibrillation, it's mandatory to get the shock delivered as quickly as possible after the onset of this arrhythmia, because the faster you deliver the shock, then the greater the chance of getting resolution back to an a regular heart rhythm, which has been the major drive to have all these automatic external defibrillators, which you will find in a lot of public places, from football stadia through to uh, airports um, and uh, public transport venues, such that if a patient does have a collapse and you can't feel a pulse, stick one of these on, you'll be, it'll be able to detect what the underlying heart rhythm is and deliver a shock if appropriate to do so, and then give you instructions to guide your resuscitation of the patient whilst you're waiting for expert help. Yes, I, I was thinking more in case of a sort of general um, level of arrhythmia rather than a, a specific sudden. Yes. Um, Coronary artery disease is, is associated uh, with a number of different arrhythmias. So mm. coronary disease is associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. Mm. Uh, is also associated with an increased risk of ventricular tachyarrhythmias, which are fast ventricular rhythms originating from the bottom chambers of the heart, the ventricles. Mm. And that is usually uh, as a result of damage and scarring of the heart as a result of previous heart attack. In mm. addition, clearly the heart arteries are also important in terms of supplying the conduction system of the heart, the electrical system that allows propagation of electrical activity mm. to have coordinated pumping of the heart muscle. If areas of those are damaged, then you can get either dyssynchronous or inefficient pumping of the heart muscle, which might need a special pacemaker device, or it can disconnect the top chambers and the bottom chambers of the heart mm. such that you develop slow heart rhythms, and that also is treated with a pacemaker. So you're absolutely right. This is all part of one sort of uh, very large uh, 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 multidisciplinary system mm -hmm. um, and damage to the heart arteries can certainly affect uh, cardiac yeah. conduction and, and the development of a rhythm. It's, it's a very good question and it is one of our weekly dilemmas really. If we see somebody with an arrhythmia and palpitations and we know they have heart artery disease as well. So I would just think it's fair to say in the general rule of thumb is if in doubt, if we think the coronary disease could in any way be contributing to a heart arrhythmia, we treat the coronary disease to see if it helps with the arrhythmia in general. Uh, well, arrhythmias are pretty common for a variety of other reasons not linked to the heart arteries. It can be the heart muscle, it can be previous scarring of the heart, so there's plenty of reasons. And there, there are also a lot of molecular work trying to understand why rhythms seem to trigger when they do. So although we do have some of the causes, we don't by all means know all of them yet. Looking at it from a point of view of early detection and prevention, and we know that uh, in a lot of cases, it's passed down through the family. It's a history. Mm. Uh, is there any way of using genealogy and DNA? Would there be any markers in that to show anyone in that family to be high risk? If you look at the general population and you look, uh, and you look at the genetic contribution to your risk of coronary artery disease, the sort of rule of thumb is about 20% genetic, 80% environment. So what we've learned uh, from looking at uh, coronary disease and looking at, um, you know, people have collected large cohorts of patients from different uh, parts of the world, collected hundreds and thousands of individuals, then looked at their gene profiles and to see, well, which particular patterns of gene profile are associated with the risk of developing coronary disease. And what we find is there's no single gene that will be able to predict your risk of coronary disease. In fact, there isn't even a panel yet of genes that can tell you about your risk of coronary artery disease. And what we've learned, I think, in general is that this is a complex interplay between the environment that you expose yourself to and your genetic predisposition. So people with a gen... And we know this from twin studies, for example. So the, the twins who are uh, monozygotic twins, so genetically identical, you put them in two different environments for whatever reasons, some develop disease and some don't. And that tells you that the environmental 
uh, cues are very important for manifesting your genetic risk. So it's not quite as simple as saying, so unfortunately, bottom line is we don't have a diagnostic test currently that can tell you you are at risk of developing a myocardial infarction. We do have some other things though. As you get older, you're at increased risk. If you have high blood pressure, smoker, cholesterol, diabetes, you're at increased risk. And, uh, and we have various scoring systems now, like the Framingham Risk Score, which is on the basis of looking at the outcomes of individuals in a small town in uh, Massachusetts, where they looked at um, various factors that enable them to predict the development of coronary disease. And really, when we look at all the genetic tests and you add them to a standard conventional Framingham Risk Score, these tests don't add anything. So we're a long way off, I'm afraid. Thank you. Take, um, one more question. So, um, all right, I'll take. I'll take the <laughs> I've got <laughs> The troponin level test is, is that a replacement for counting enzymes, or is that the same thing? Uh, it is a so, cardiac enzyme. Uh, but it, it's not. Look, it is part of the heart muscle pro, uh, heart muscle uh, pumping apparatus, if you like. Right. Uh, and it is very specific for heart muscle. Uh, and it, you're absolutely right, it has replaced testing of cardiac oh. enzymes. So in order for you to have a myocardial infarction in the current WHO and global definition, you need to have an elevation of your troponin. So it's a more accurate measurement. Isn't it? Because of its specificity yeah. in terms of its origin for coming from heart muscle. Thank you. I've recently had a screening of my carotid arteries and I'm wondering if there is a case to be made for a screening uh, schedule to try and catch this problem in the general population. Can I tell you one? I, did, I did a lot of my PhD in Please scanning do. carotid arteries. So there's no doubt that if you use ultrasound and you measure the thickness of the carotid artery, the thickness of that artery, it could be because of the buildup of this plaque substance, but it can also get thicker due to high blood pressure and smoking. The thickness of that artery does seem to correlate to some extent with your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. It's a difficult measurement to get right if you use an ultrasound. You have to have the probe at the right angle and you have to have somebody very experienced in doing it. So um, ultrasound can be used for screening. The tricky bit is that we've never really shown that by taking that measurement, adding it to all these existing risk factors that Dr. De Silva spoke about and treating patients that we've been able to bring down their risk. And for many of the things we do, that's the real challenge. We're good at spotting problems, but we need to learn how to fix them. Um, there is a company, uh, called, I don't know if they did your scan, called, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten, Life Science, something like that, that were at one stage in shopping malls offering carotid scans. And there's no doubt that occasionally they will get lucky. They will pick up very badly carotid, narrowed carotid arteries, which do need to be operated on. But for the majority of people, although we have that link between artery thickness and cardiovascular risk, turning that into useful information to decrease the risk is the difficult thing. And therefore, in terms of a screening program, it probably wouldn't meet any cost effectiveness criteria. And it doesn't really add over and above your framing and risk score. Yeah. In terms of age and your conventional risk factors. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's clear that as we get older, our blood pressures tend to rise, our cholesterols tend to rise, our cardiovascular risk is going up and therefore we need to pay more attention to those things. And it's probably better to do it earlier in order to prevent that furring from happening in the first place. Mine was, was done. I have a, um, one of the um, uh, vascular surgeons at the local hospital as a friend. Yes. And uh, I, my family has this uh, horrendous um, problem that so many of us have died of strokes. Yeah. So, uh, our mine were checked, and they were in very good condition. But, uh, you know, it's just, it just seemed to me perhaps 
is there some other way of, of, of checking yeah. the cardio, the, 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 the arteries around the heart, which, which would in fact... Well, well, we have one. So we, we now do CT scans and estimate the amount of calcium in the arteries. And again, there has been a link shown between the amount of calcium in the arteries and your chances of having some form of heart attack or stroke. Again, the challenge comes in taking that information in a disease process that's already established in the artery and treating the patient so that that risk goes away. And that's the tricky bit. And when ultrasound's fine because it's benign, cheap, easy to do, but a CT scan exposes you to some radiation. So it's a much bigger debate about whether we can translate that useful information into actually saving people's lives. Yeah, and applying that to a general asymptomatic population. Yeah, yeah. Screening now, when do you start screening? Do you have to repeat the process? It's a method that requires exposure to radiation, as Alistair said. These are fraught with difficulties, and, and, I, and I think what we do know, there's a couple of things with CT scanning, because it's a particular bugbear of mine. <laughs> so, uh, because what we do know from the, initial, from, uh, the literature is CT, uh, from the CT scans, um, the uh, assessment of your, of, the type of your plaque morphology, i.e. the shape and composition of the plaque, because it's intrinsically quite low resolution, does not match up well when we try to match it up with our intravascular imaging techniques. So it's giving you a limited amount of information. What it's telling you about is, look, I've got a large burden of atherosclerosis in my coronary arteries, but it doesn't tell you, and so the more you have, then the probability of one of those plaques in there causing a problem down the track, but it doesn't necessarily tell you this individual plaque in this location is going to cause you a problem downstream. So it's hedging. Good time. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I've kind of got two questions because um, you mentioned um, calcium deposits, mm. which, and uh, I wonder. Um, one question: Is there any harm in taking calcium supplements, which I'm having to do for different for osteoporosis? Uh, no, no problems okay. with calcium okay. supplements. Okay. Yeah. And the other question is: um, You've talked a lot about surgical intervention, um, but. Is there any sort of viable medical approach to reducing the, the deposits at all? There was, um, I did once see something about statins actually thought to have actually reduced or smoothed down the plaques. Yeah, so what we do know is that very intensive cholesterol reduction can be associated with plaque uh, regression, i.e. plaques getting smaller, providing that the plaques are not already well established and organized, okay? Uh, so um, uh, we also know that statins are very important in terms of uh, uh, quietening down a lot of the inflammation that's going in within the vessel wall that is, also, that is doing two things. First of all, it's increasing the rate of deposition of that, all that bad cholesterol within the artery wall and propagating the development of further narrowing. And secondly, the inflammation is important in terms of weakening the surface of the blood vessel wall, making it more prone to rupture and the formation of those blood clots that re lead to a heart attack. Um, so uh, do we have a, uh, a magic bullet uh, for um, reversing advanced established plaques? No. Do we have good tools for preventing plaque development in high-risk individuals? Yes, statins are pretty good at that. Okay, just like to thank everybody very much for coming tonight and all the very insightful questions and thank Alistair and Ranel as well for a really good presentation. So thank you very much. Pleasure.